Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome again to our Wednesday night refresh, close-ups of Jesus through the lens of Mark's gospel. It's one of the nice things about our Wednesdays. There's nothing else to really uh, work into the study time. It's just open up the Bible, study the life of Jesus, lessons from it. We're finishing Mark 6 and then into Mark 7. Look up under this first point, Mark chapter 6, verses 45 and 46, on, on the proper responses to the crisis of life. Mark 6, 45, immediately he, that's Jesus, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Now, it's interesting when you look at John talking about the same uh, event in the life of Jesus. L look at the way John describes it. It's in John 6, 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And so, and so the little detail that John gives you, Mark is a much more condensed gospel account. He moves through his events very quickly. And the, the idea you get from John is, is that these people were just so badly misunderstanding. They, they saw what Jesus was doing. They were impressed by the signs. And then they, they wanted to come immediately and make him their king. And, and it's at that point, Mark says, Jesus went all by himself up into a mountain alone to pray. And this wasn't the only time Jesus did this. You'll, you'll see during his ministry, Mark talks about a number of occasions where, where there are these times of, of particular stress, um, people misunderstanding, pressure points in the life of Jesus, and, and he constantly goes off by himself. His immediate response is to get away from everything and to pray. It's in, it's in Mark 1, 35 to 39. It's in Mark 6, 45 and 46. It's in Mark 14, 26 to 42. And whenever a situation like this comes up, here's the people. They're coming by force to make, they love what Jesus is doing. They want to make him their king. And Jesus gets off alone, but it's not just sort of for serenity. He gets off alone to, to pray. And you, you just get the feeling that, that Jesus takes time again to refocus refocus on his purpose, his mission on earth, to reaffirm his commitment to the Father's will. I, I don't mean, I don't mean that he ever doubted God's plan or wasn't sure why he came. I don't mean that at all. I just mean that Jesus doesn't live life like a fake human being in this world. He, he genuinely in ways we can't understand the condescension of his incarnation. He genuinely sustains himself, sustains his calling, sustains himself in prayer. So prayer in the life of Jesus, prayer is linked to keeping first things first. It, it's how you and I, it's how we can ground ourselves in the plan of God, in the will of God. The tendency, you know, you see people pray, especially in church. We close our eyes. We look to heaven and we, and we pray. And the tendency is to think of prayer as a religious exercise. And what you see in this passage is, for Jesus, prayer is the way, prayer is the way he kept all of the other parts of his life in focus and on track. It isn't just by blind divine power. Jesus is fully human, like we are. So, so it's, it's how all of the non-religious parts of our lives are meant to be sustained and, and kept on track. The importance of prayer isn't just for that moment we're on our knees with our eyes closed. 
That's not it at all. The importance of prayer, your time, my time, we get this from the model of Jesus, the, the importance of prayer is for the parts of life when we rise from our knees. It's the other non-religious parts of our lives that are directed, focused, kept on track by our times of prayer. And it's beautiful to see that in the life of Jesus. Here's, here's a second point. It's, in, it's from Mark 6, 47 to 52. I, I want to talk to you under this point about gaining strength for the present from miracles of grace in the past. And, and here's where I think it's so interesting. Mark 6, 47. And when evening came, the boat was out at sea, and he was alone on the land. Okay, so the disciples are in the boat. Jesus is on the land. 48. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. Interesting, eh? 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. 51. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Now, look at 52. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. That doesn't even seem to fit there. Somehow, somehow, as Jesus assesses this situation, the way Mark records it, they were terrified seeing Jesus. They think it's a ghost. He gets into the boat. The winds cease, and they're astounded. And then you get these, these strange words because they did not understand about the loaves. What, what does the feeding of the 5,000 have to do with their response to Jesus walking on the water? And the impression you get, I want to talk about this for a minute, because the impression you get is, if those words mean anything at all, if they're true, the disciples could have been greatly helped in the storm, apparently, if they had been thinking deeply enough about what Jesus had done in the feeding of the 5,000 with those loaves. That's what he says in verse 52. So apparently, they had marveled about what Jesus did feeding the 5,000. They marveled at the miracle without being sustained by the miracle. They somehow, their hearts were hardened, it says in verse 52. So they didn't understand the significance of a past miracle for their present circumstances. It, we, we studied this a little bit in the parable of the soils. I'm thinking about the way Mark says their hearts were hardened, and, and Jesus talked about that wayside, that hard soil where the, 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 the seed gets there, the, the information's there, but it, but it doesn't penetrate. It doesn't get inside. It doesn't go deep. The disciples should have been more than just amazed when they saw Jesus feed the 5,000. Somehow, there was something they should have carried along in their present experience that would have helped them in the storm on the sea. It's interesting to see other places in the Scriptures where, where you encounter the way the church eventually did start to learn about past events of grace and how they need to be carried and applied, mentally applied to present circumstances. I was looking at, I was looking at Acts chapter uh, 4. I don't really have time to do this, but let me, let me just read Acts 4, 23. This is when uh, the two disciples are released from prison. They go back to the church. And Acts 4.23 says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. No more proclaiming Jesus. That's what they told them. And when they, the church, when they heard it, they, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, listen, who made 
the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord. So, so what? notice what the church is doing. They're taking the miracle of creation. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea and everything in them. So now the church is learning. They're taking the events of a past miracle, God's work in creation, and they're saying, and just as you were in charge of all creation, you are in charge over the kings and the rulers of the earth. Your past power in creation, your creative energy isn't just in setting the heavens in place. It's for our present circumstance. So they take the past supernatural work of God and they apply it to their present circumstances. It's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing. Here's another place where you'll see the very same thing. It's in uh, Romans 8. Romans 8, you know these words, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? So condemnation, guilt, despair. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now listen to these words in 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That's on the cross. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And you see what, you see what they're doing. They're learning. The work of God's grace, Jesus dying on the cross. That's a past event that God has done in his mercy. But their application, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So there's the event, God did the event. The significance of the event, thinking through the event and applying it to present circumstance, God doesn't do that. That's what they have to do. So they, they, have to, they have to think through the significance. God has already done the greatest work on our behalf. So surely he'll do the lesser things. See, there's an example again of the church learning to take past miracles of power and grace that God does and to be sustained by them as they apply them to present circumstances. Jesus said they, they weren't doing that, even with the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Point number three. Now we're just going to get into Mark 7, the first 23 verses. I want to talk to you briefly about how, how life can get sec, sucked out of organized religion. And, and the fact that Jesus talks about this for a good number of verses, it shows that it was close to his heart. I have uh, three or four thoughts under the first 23 verses of Mark 7. First, so A, Jesus states three times that these religious leaders were actually using their religion to wipe out the will and law of God. Look at Mark 7. Um, just to save time, I'm going to jump in at verse 6, okay? Okay. Jesus speaking to the religious leaders, and he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Wow. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their, their heart. Jesus is going to talk about their heart a lot. Their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. They think they're worshiping God. They think they're trying to please God. It's all in vain. In vain do they worship me. What's the problem? Middle of verse 7, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Verse 9, and he said to them, now he's going to get specific. You have a fine way of rejecting, rejecting the commandment of God. Jesus isn't against commandments. He's talking about the way they treat the true commandments and replace them with false ones. Nine, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say... 
If a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, something, so my inheritance that I could, I could use to care for you and look after you, I'm sorry, it's dedicated to God, I won't be able to, I won't be able to look after you at all. And Jesus says, well, that's just neglecting the Ten Commandments. You set up a phony regulation so you don't have to obey the commandments. You say, verse 11, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, 12, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and many such things you do. Now, Jesus isn't saying, you know, follow me and there are no rules. He's not saying that at all. He has traditions that he adheres to, the baptism, uh, the Lord's Supper, a number of things that Jesus uh, commanded, and we were to follow. But the, the point that Jesus is making is these people, they worship in vain. He says their heart, their heart was far from him. So uh, religious rules, regulations only have value to the degree that they are performed with a heart loving God, a heart understanding God's mercy and grace, a heart that longs to please him. But what, what happens so often with religion, people don't regularly use religion. Paul talks about this in Romans 1. We don't use religion to find God. We actually use religion to avoid God, specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ, the need for his Holy Spirit to change and transform our lives. B, here's, here's something else. People have a tendency to generate laws to cover areas where the law of God is, is silent. Here's just an example. Uh, the Old Testament law about ceremonial washings. You can read about it in Exodus 30, 17 and on, and in Exodus 40, verse 12. But these commands were given to the priesthood. And what had happened is the elders had extended the application to cover all people all the time and all the things they had to do with all these washings. So the simple fact is this. Rules tend to multiply in religion where the gospel and the Holy Spirit particularly are left out. We, we have this idea if we reject the gospel, reject Jesus Christ and his grace and the inner work through repentance of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, uh, we will tend to, the, o the only thing we can stand on is the multiplication of rules and regulations, the kind of things we can keep that keep us from dealing with the sinfulness in our hearts, deep in our own hearts. C. Outward regulations, while useful at times for restraining evil, never can transform the heart. Uh, Romans 13 is just the classic passage. There, God has ordained uh, legal structures and laws for, for the restraining of evil, the rewarding of good, and the restraining of evil. But, but only, only the Holy Spirit and only God's grace can transform the heart, not just restrain evil, but transform the heart, causing people to love and prefer righteousness. D, the danger of man-made regulations is their tendency to replace the law of God as the measuring stick for our holiness. Our, our, our tendency is to always replace more important things with less important regulations that are easier to keep. It, it feeds our pride. It feeds the mistaken notion that we can somehow uh, establish our own righteousness before God when we can't. And, and Jesus gives that little illustration. Uh, it's, it's in verses uh, 11 and 12 where, where these religious leaders had found ways of not having to spend their money on their aging parents. And the way they would do it is they would just say, I'm sorry, this money, I've, I've dedicated it to the Lord. And, and you can just see the way 
greed, and a fallen heart uh, can't be changed by regulations. We'll find regulations that'll work around our fallenness. We'll find rules that we can keep and sustain our selfishness and our pride, our sense of our own righteousness. So without the gospel and without the inward work of the Holy Spirit, um, people will always do two things with religious rules and regulations. First, we'll always use God's word to lovelessly sort of stick it to other people when we see them fail. Our own sense of pride in keeping certain regulations makes us look down on people who don't keep them. Secondly, we will use our religious rituals and rules and regulations to cancel out what we, what we know to be true of our own hearts, what we know to be true of our own need for redemption. Our accomplishment of certain outward regulations, if we keep them, it makes us proudly self-reliant and not open to the deep work of God's grace in our hearts. I was looking at Psalm 51, that great prayer of David, when, when he realizes the sin in his own heart and the, and the deep need for a renewal right spirit within me. Psalm 51, 16 and 17, David says, For you will not delight in sacrifice. God commanded the sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. God commanded those burnt offerings. So what does David mean? 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So what I would take away from my own life, remember that past miraculous works of grace it's easy to be impressed with them and read about them in the Gospels, but the impact on our life, the application in faith, it's not automatically self-sustaining. You think through past works of grace. If Jesus died for my sins, paid the great price, how will he not freely, graciously give us all things? You make the application. You connect the dots. And then secondly, uh, the deep change that the Lord wants to make in my heart is not just to make me a lawless creature, surely, but it's to, it's to bring about a love for the Lord in my heart that my outward acts of holiness make me non-judgmental toward others and make me deeply concerned about the state of my own heart. And they make me more reliant on God's grace and his mercy. And that's a good study a good text for us to study together. Let's pray. We do thank you for the, the truths that we can glean from your word when we look at Jesus. Beholding the glory of our Lord, Paul says, we're transformed from one degree of glory to another. Help us, Father, to gain strength from all past works of grace as we apply the logic of them to our present circumstances. And help us, Lord Jesus, help us, Lord Jesus, to, to, to know your word, to have a love for Jesus that makes holiness not list-keeping, but the devotion of a broken and contrite heart. Keep us walking softly, repentantly, with understanding before your word, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you Sunday morning if you registered. If not, we're uh, live streaming, keeping your joy, the heartfelt theology of an isolated prisoner. We'll be studying that from Philippians in the morning. And keeping going with our series, Repentance, Sunday night at 6.30. God bless you, church. Stay in the word. Love one another.